Okay, everybody, welcome to the brain map. Um, um, we have today Agustin Ibanez from Argentina with us today, and he's the director of the Cognitive Neuroscience Center at the Universidad de San Andres uh, in Argentina, as well as a senior Atlantic fellow of the Global Brain Health Institute. He received funding from the Inter-American Development Bank, um, from, the, from Chile, um, funding from Colombia, Slovakia, Germany, United Kingdom, uh, the INECO and CONICET from Argentina, as well as the Alzheimer Association, TAN Consortium, uh, GBHI, and NIH. He has directed and co-directed more than 30 postgraduate research projects and established international collaborations with centers of excellence. Um, He's the member of the task force of the Human Affectome Project. He studied a specific brain networks in frontotemporal dementia, al al Alzheimer's disease, and other neurodegenerative conditions associated with sensitive measures of social cognition measure and embodied cognitive processes. He combines genetic imaging and behavioral assessment in the study of neurogeneration and develop, develop a multimodal approach of AD and BBFTD. He lead the neuroimaging core of the largest longitudinal study of dementia in, dementia in South America. Uh, and he will talk today about this multi-partner consortium to expand dementia research in Latin America. So thank you for coming, Austin. And with that, I give you the, the, the voice. And also like everybody, if you have questions, uh, please uh, use the QA box. And, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Vivi. It's a great pleasure to me. Thank you also, Chiara, for organizing this. Uh, so very happy to share with you a large project that we are beginning to launch across so many centers in Latin America, and I think that they are for critical relevance for future research of the main chain in the region. So please, be free to stop me and ask, ask any question during the talk. <clears throat> so just three seconds for my disclosures. Um, so first of all, why Latin America and why dementia? So dementia is a neurodegenerative condition, but is deeply affected uh, by sociocultural settings. And as you may know, in our region, we have huge inequality. We have a really, really fragile health system and we have a lot of poverty. Poverty and all the <clears throat> associated conditions, clinical and socioeconomical conditions impacting the neurodegeneration and impacting dementia. In fact, in, dementia, in, La in Latin America, uh, together with Africa, we right now have the worst prevalence. And, and while the prevalence is becoming stable or, or declining in US or high income countries in Latin America is rising very quick. <clears throat> we will have a <clears throat> really, really big numbers for the next 20 years. <clears throat> and as I will show you today, uh, there is a um, very um, dangerous combination of genetics factors and socioeconomical determinant of health. Moreover, all the groups work in isolation with low capacity building. Um, uh, we have a, uh, a, one of the largest kindred of genetic presentations, like for example, for Alzheimer's dementia, we have the largest one in all the world. We also have the largest uh, from ataxia, from Huntington disease, for genetic presentation of Parkinson's and for other many conditions. So recently we begin to launch the Latin American and Caribbean Consortium of Dementia in our first uh, paper that we published several years ago, I mean two years ago. We already proposed um, this important huge aspect to combine environmental and genetic interactions and trying to improve the capacity building of the center at the same time and develop multi-centers approach. So <clears throat> in the case of Latin America, potential modif modifiable factors like, you know, hypertension, obesity, smoking, uh, quality of life, diabetes, all associated with uh, 
educational background and socioeconomic uh, uh, status. Uh, seems to explain more than the 50% of the presentation of dementia, more than any other region in the in the world. So uh, socioeconomic uh, status and social determinant of health, including, for example, economic stability, educational background, uh, risk for the families, uh, how is your environmental, etc., seem to explain a lot of the presentation of dementia in the region. <clears throat> and in fact predict uh, uh, multiple levels of dementia from you know prote proteins like tau presentations to uh, uh, late and early presentation but at the same time uh, latin america is a very rich admixture population combining people from uh, combining traditions coming from europe but also native and also african especially in the center and, 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 and the north part of Latin America. So maybe it's because of that that we have the largest population of familial uh, dementia presentations. Um, the role of genetics in admixture presentation is really, really underestimated. Uh, um, we don't know that much about the specific genetics of Latin America. Uh, and probably <clears throat> combination of long period of isolations, endogamy, uh, and the combination of different uh, ancient populations giving this high risk for dementia. Nobody knows very well why, but this is a potential explanation. At the same time, when you look at the wealth map, you see that most of the wealth is in the north, right? As we all know. But in fact, the, the, the dementia research is also <clears throat> distributed in this way. And this is a, a little bit of paradoxical because most of the cases in the future will come from, from Latin America. And in fact, the regional research priorities for brain disease has been shown that the, that the dementia and all the lifestyle factors that are impacting in dementia are likely to be influenced by genetic factors in the region. <clears throat> so we need to, uh, provide a more global picture of dementia and we need to characterize uh, better the genetics and the genetic environmental interaction of dementia. <clears throat> Given those backgrounds that we want to do is to use this challenge that we have in Latin America to change them to opportunities. So our, our main goal is to identify genetics uh, contribution as well social determinant of health and socioeconomic status that drive two very important uh, presentation of dementia, namely the Alzheimer disease and the frontotemporal dementia. And we want to compare the risk, the genetic and environmental risk in Latin America relatively to the uh, US. So <clears throat> we are going to launch a, a, a first class core, including 10 centers in six Latin American countries and one US, US centers. Uh, we want to work with a strong standardized assessments for all levels from genetic, behavior, neuroimaging, <clears throat> in order to harmonize and making comparable <clears throat> samples that are extremely uh, heterogeneous. For that, we are going to use innovative techniques of machine learning. We want to make this research really open. Um, <clears throat> we want to empower the local centers. So that we are expected to find in overall that, that they are unique risk factors for AD and FTD in Latin America at both level, genetic, but also environmental when we compare it with, um, with US populations. And this is important because we'll impact in, in the treatments, char characterizations and future um, pharmacological treatments. So uh, I am the pleasure of coordinating this large project involved um, two main hubs, one from UCSF, led by Dr. Bruce Miller uh, in the Memory and Aging Clinic, and also from the other side, Ken Kosick in the University of California, Santa Barbara, with a core for imaging and multimodal uh, assessment, another core for genetics and cognition, and with a uh, <clears throat> uh, representative for each country, including US, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Mexico, Chile, and, and other centers uh, from Latin America. 
So taking in mind these two main predictors, social determinants of health and genetics, that we want to do is compare the presentation of these two types of dementia, AD and FTD, and using four genetics to approach that I will talk a little bit later about uh, typical case control studies, but also polygenic risk score. Right? And then at neuroscience level, we want to use machine learning for developing a probability measures of atrophy and connectivity that are that could be able to be compared across centers. And for cognition, we are going to use harmonize uh, uh, assessment that I have been used in many parts of the world, but most of those harmonized uh, assessment are not robust for cultural or socioeconomical difference. So we are also implementing innovative cognitive tasks uh, that should be better suited to deal with the cross-cultural difference. Um, so our first aim is to establish genetic contributions to AD and FTD in diverse Latin American cohorts. Uh, that um, we are doing now is first of all, is screening for, for autosomal dominant mutations in known genes from our samples. We expected between 10 and 20% of the cases having some kind of autosomal dominant mutation. And for this, we are working in GWAS studies of uh, genetic modifiers and we are going to um, characterize families to future development of uh, um, <clears throat> genetic therapies that I will talk a little bit later. For the remaining 80%, estimated 80% of the cases, we are going to develop a, a, a polygenic risk score. The polygenic risk score is a measure of risk that doesn't depend on a single gene. Instead, it's looking for Thousand of SNP that have a smaller risk factor for dementia across each subject. And then you make an, a large study with a, um, uh, one study in our, in our sample. And then we are going to replicate that in another available data set from Latin America. And that we expect to find is that the PRS, the polygenic risk score, will not be work for Latin American uh, populations in comparison with the U.S. population because we expect to have a different uh, diffuse genetic background. And this is very important because PRS has already have been shown, for, for example, in cardiovascular disease that uh, almost 35% of, of the sporadic presentations are triggered by a high PRS. So it's very important to understand more subtle genetic uh, impacts that interact with the environment. But at the same time, from all the PRS reported in the world, less than 3% of those studies has been developed with the indigenous or Latinian population. So we really, really, really need to move forward and have a better uh, representative sample for PRS across the world. In Latin America, we have large families with um, <clears throat> unknown mutation. This is a case of a family that have an autosomal dominant presentation with very early onset of dementia and no one single gene known. In other regions that we are studying, like Aransasu, 45 of the children have a kind of affective symptoms. They all, most of them, they have family abrogation and we have an incredible high number or prevalence of dementia across those participants. So we're beginning to do genetic assessment. In a preliminary study of, of the ancestry of the genetics of all samples, we have been shown that <clears throat> around 90% are, are mixtures. So are a combination of American, native, and European populations, also with African. And this suggests that uh, uh, unique genetic factors are to be discovered in this population. In fact, with, with, with our first sample, um, most of the patients that have a familiar presentation don't, don't have a causative known gene. So in the first polygenic risk score that has been reported until now, uh, we have been shown that, it has been shown, sorry, that uh, uh, the local data is well predicted by the PRS, and namely in Brazil, but when we try to when, when the people try to predict the PRS in uh, US population, it doesn't work, suggesting that we have a different diffuse uh, genetic background. We are beginning to work with different kind of uh, tau pathology that has been identified across the Latin American cities and are 
of critical importance for future trials. So that we are going to do in, in the in the aim in one is to characterize from basic, like namely the frequency of genet of autosomal dominant presentation in Latin America to more advanced PRS uh, approach to genetics. In the aim two, we are going to elucidate the impact of social determinant of health and, and socioeconomic factor on clinical cognitive and brain imaging signatures. For that, we have developed with the experts across the world a questionnaire to and deeply assess these uh, uh, socioeconomic or I will say uh, socioeconomic for both, social determinants of socioeconomic status. <clears throat> and for cognition, we are going to use like the UDS is the standard battery for evaluate cognition in dementia across US and most of the European centers. But also we are developing uh, <clears throat> cognitive measures in TAPCAT. TAPCAT is a tablet-based platform that is, has been used in more than 14 countries with different language. And we already have been proven that it's a powerful tool to assess <clears throat> different aspect of dementia, not only for ED, but also for frontotemporal dementia, and is more powerful than the basic cognitive screening available like the MOCA or the Adams Group cognitive examination. For <clears throat> normalization, we are going to apply um, um, PCA, principal component analysis and many other machine learnings approaches to normalize the data. We are using a large number of controls in order to create probabilities for the patient at behavioral, stru brain structural and functional connectivity levels and comparing the probabilities from different patients from different countries, but already normalized by controls. This will allow us to compare extreme heterogeneous populations in the region. Uh, we are also uh, going to develop a sensitive experimental task like the short-term memory binding task. It's a, it's a short-term memory task that has been proven very powerful to detect dementia even at early stages. And for frontotemporal dementia, we're going to, to assess this different aspect of social cognition. So the frontotemporal dementia is a neurodegenerative condition that is characterized by changes in personality, but also uh, um, deficit in social cognition that are usually associated with the frontotemporal insular hubs uh, uh, that are affected in this condition. So for that, we are going to use the, <clears throat> the MINISEA. It's a very short task for assessing emotional recognition and mentalizing our theory of mind. We are now collecting uh, <clears throat> data for 12 countries in order to normalize and harmonize this uh, task. But we are also dealing with uh, <clears throat> different uh, MRI recordings with different parameters. Uh, um, uh, even when we are going to harmonize the recording parameters, we want to develop a pipeline that is robust for assessing different parameter recordings because we want to compare our samples with many other samples across the world. So we have developed a pipeline using machine learning and confusion matrix to extract the source of variation that is explained by the MRIs and the parameters and then using a specific classifiers of neurodegeneration. We have been shown that very powerful measures like more than 90% of classification with multimodal imaging. So for example, we only have a from a study from three centers, only one subject, a control subject that was uh, not correctly classified, and this participant have a high degree of atrophy, <clears throat> brain atrophy. We also have combined this approach with a cognitive measure and already have begun to show that uh, with very small samples, we are able to have a really powerful classification of Alzheimer's and FTD and differentiation between both conditions. Our challenge now is to begin to classify different steps of, of uh, disease severity. We have been also uh, using uh, brain dynamic fluctuation instead of the typical connectivity measures. As you may know, 99% um, of the studies in dementia have been using poorly uh, static and linear metric of connectivity, even when um, dynamical approach has been developing in, in neuroimaging in other fields, in dementia they are not being used systematically. 
uh, we have developed uh, a combination of uh, dynamic assessment. That's mean that when you are looking at connectivity, you are not looking at this kind of connectivity, right? So this kind, for example. So we have been using measure of um, <clears throat> mutual information and copulas to develop this kind of nonlinear and linear connectivity. But we also have been shown that uh, not only connectivity is interesting, but more interesting is the fluctuation of the cognitivity. We tend to think uh, that connectivity uh, is something dynamic, right? Because the brain is a uh, self-organized system, so it's fluctuating and changing all the time. But unfortunately, most of our measure of connectivity doesn't capture this fluctuation. And especially in dementia field, most of the studies doesn't capture that at all. So we have developed this measure and we have looking at the at the, at the fluctuation of the network instead of to the static average. And with this approach, we have found beautiful results with high level of classification, high level of differentiation between AD and FTD, and even across different centers, four different centers, and we have developed generalization from one center to another center. So we are very confident that these kind of measures can really improve the characterization. Now we are beginning to use this to make more subtle predictions of a cognitive or clinical presentation of, of the patient. And finally, our third aim is, uh, is to combine the different information that we will have at all level from uh, socioeconomical to clinical, cognitive, multimodal neuroimaging, and to identify the best predictor of that, and genetics, sorry, to identify the, the best predictor of that and comparing US samples with Latin American samples in order to identify what are the most powerful features that predict and differentiate the disease across North and South. Uh, a big problem of neural generation is the multimodal heterogeneity, ranging from genetics uh, to phenotypes, including clinical and cognitive and neuroimaging results. So I think that it's very important to tackle this heterogeneity. It's not something that we have to avoid. On the contrary, it's a um, multi-level information that we have to recap and, and, and use it as a very pluralistic approach to have a better char characterization of the disease. So with the sample that we are designing and we a strong process of normalization and using process for uh, progressive future eliminations, we may be able to uh, identify the main features that characterize uh, US uh, versus Latin American uh, populations. But we don't want to make our, our network uh, devoted exclusively to uh, research. We are very interested in developing capacity building. So now we, with the Latin American and Caribbean Consortium of Non Dementia, that I have the pleasure to coordinate more than 200 uh, experts in the regions has proposing a knowledge to action framework and a plan to deal with the uh, extreme inequalities that we are facing, not only at the level of the patient, but also at the level of the infrastructure capacity building and researchers. And we are trying to develop training protocols, connections with the uh, different uh, high income coming high income coming uh, countries uh, uh, researchers and develop a horizontal communication for clinical care and research. We are also developing um, automatic measures like a you know, short speech recording of two minutes that can be then used in machine learning to classify patients that can be scalable and, generous and can be applied across all Latin America. And we are planning to make a, a open uh, sharing access to these tools soon. With Takeda, it's a pharmaceutical company, we also want to include the assessment of EG and compare how good and bad are different measures of EG, including uh, temporal connectivity, uh, source estimation, oscillations, decoding, and many other features of resting state EG and comparing to the resting state of MRI and fMRI, sorry, and fMRI, sorry, and cognition and see how much the EG can add to characterize the patients. And this is important also for the region because EEG is a very inexpensive technology and can be relatively 
scalable across different Latin American centers. We are also <clears throat> developing collaboration with uh, already devoted uh, networks like Diane is the largest network for uh, dementia, present, genetic dementia, dementia presentations. We are creating a couple of centers, one in Cali, another in Chile to support the network. Uh, we also have created recently with the Inter-American Developmental Bank the basic steps to develop a platform for registry because we don't have any kind of registry in Latin America for the patient, for the diagnosis, for the clinical assessment. And, and this is of huge importance for future data sharing, for developing of treatments and for, uh, for getting information about demographic, epidemiology and many other basic uh, measurements. In Chile, we are going to create a Brain Health Institute uh, in, <clears throat> uh, in association with the Global Brain Health Institute at UCSF. And we hope that this institute will be a hub to promote the research in Latin America focused in brain health and especially in dementia. We already have begun to develop also tools for the researchers, so we are now almost publishing the first manual for diagnosis of dementia. This is a regional manual that take into consideration difference across countries, take, take also into consideration the difference in socioeconomical aspect of the, uh, of the different conditions. <clears throat> we hope that this kind of tools will help the clinicians and will help the researchers also to, to harmonize and to develop, to develop better practices. We are making continuous calls for uh, uh, research topics and special issues in the region. And now we are preparing, uh, sorry, we are preparing uh, a set of training across the region that will be free, open, and accessible for any clinic, clinics in the different Latin American countries. Just to let you know how important is the gap that we have to cover. In, we performed a study with more than 3,000 uh, Latin American professionals working in aging uh, across 19 uh, Latin American countries. And that we found is that the, in most of the countries, the access to the knowledge of dementia from the uh, health system is really not at all accessible or really poor accessible across countries, across regions, across age of participants. So <clears throat> the health systems don't provide an adequate uh, information for the communities. The same regarding the transmission of, of, of this knowledge and uh, the knowledge of public policies for dementia that are critical to develop adequate responses to dementia, to, the, to develop uh, prevention initiatives, to maximize the chances to make good research are really low in the region, um, especially in, in, in the South part, and I mean in South America, comparing with Mexico or Central America, uh, there is a big gap of this knowledge. Uh, we also uh, have a high level of stigma, even across, you know, professionals working in, in aging, there is a high level of stigma regarding having dementia. That is a real barrier to develop good care, good diagnosis, timely diagnosis and, and research. Uh, luckily, most of the centers in Latin America they need manuals, they need data sharing platform, they are open to collaborate. There are so many groups in Latin America that they have access to unique populations, uh, but they don't have the support, they don't have time, they don't have the money for make research and they don't have the clinical or, or, or technical preparation. So I think that this, we really need a global approach to the disease in order to uh, not only good made research, but also to improve the assessment. And um, we also want to raise a strong awareness of the huge impact that the uh, um, coronavirus is going to have in the dementia populations in Latin America. At the beginning, some scholars have been proposed that the coronavirus is not a problem in Latin America because weather, condition, weather conditions will help because we take advantage of the experience of other countries, 
and, and many other arguments. But let me show you a short modeling of data that we have performed. So first of all, um, these are the, the rate of uh, confirmed accumulated deaths in, the, in time. And you see Asia that is, you know, beginning to reduce the exponential effect because China reduction in the cases. Europe is going fast, uh, US and Canada are going fast, and Latin America is going really fast. When you look at the proportion between new deaths and confirmed accumulated deaths, you see that the, the growing of Latin America is exponential. Uh, but the big problem that uh, the worst combination of uh, huge inequalities, Latin America is the region with the largest inequality in the world. With the impact of the coronavirus, we'll have in the dementia patients a uh, terrible impact. Uh, telemedicine is not properly designed already in Latin America, can, you know, just uh, being implemented in a small percentage of the patients, and we even don't have any massive testing, even when there is now available very inexpensive test for make massive, massive assessment. So we are now moving to trying to develop an urgent regional plan. All the research in Latin America for dementia has been stopped, or 90%, I would say and we are facing big problems and dementia patients are not, not only at higher risk because the age, but also because of our, uh, because all the comorbidities that the dementia patients have, like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, cerebrovascular disease, are usually present in dementia patients. So we are anticipating a huge impact of the disease in the region. Uh, we also have identified unique families in the region that we are beginning to study. And we uh, have been also beginning to develop trainings. Unfortunately, the coronavirus has stopped the training, but we have a first shot of training for assessing, you know, basic clinical uh, diagnosis, procedures for harmonization, but also to consider the local regulation and the local tools for diagnosis dementia. The patients are not only dependent on genes that are variable across the region, but also, uh, you know, the family structure, cultural settings, etc. So we have to develop uh, tools that can be comparable across countries, but at the same time that can be sensitive for the local aspect. So we have been working very hard to develop that kind of assessment together with basic ass assessment of cognitive, clinical assessment, but also, you know, the standard pipelines for DNA delivery and for genetic studies to warranty quality check process. The same with imaging, we are working you know, with different MRIs, as small MRIs, like 1.5 Tesla, but can be also used and then how to maximize the parameter recording, how to develop uh, tools for using machine learning to extract the sources of variability. And we beginning to make this training in, in six countries, but we were not able to continue because of the coronavirus, but we are now preparing web seminars and tutorials to make these uh, trainings. Uh, with remote access. So in brief, our philosophy is strongly focuses in data sharing at local publications. We want to improve the local researchers. We want to help them in Latin America, big barrier is language. So we are funding writers, English, English speaker writers that can help with data analysis, with writing of paper and empowering the voices of local uh, groups. We are maximizing the horizontal co uh, communication and, and making open data sharing to all. Uh, and we are trying to develop a kind of research that can be basic and have a strong impact, for example, at genetics or you know, at, at the having a more, rep more representative data from neuroimaging for dementia, but at the same time, generating implementation science. That means improving the healthcare system, improving the care of the patient, including the training of the health professionals, and trying to use this evidence for informing the uh, policy makers. Uh, 
So we recently launched the Latin American and Caribbean Consortium on Dementia webpage. You can have a look at that and you can load a lot of, you can find a lot of information there regarding all groups, all projects, and how to become a member, how to collaborate, how to access to data that we want to share. And something very important that is part for our Global Brain Health Institute is the, uh, the understanding that the dementia like coronavirus is a global problem, cannot be tackled and in an isolated fashion and Latin America will have one of the largest contribution of dementia patients in the future. So we need to think globally to address solutions and to use research to moving forward towards a, a strategy for therapeutic uh, treatment. I just want to say thank you so much uh, for uh, the, the group that I have the pleasure to represent, including so many centers and being supported uh, in parallel by the National Institute of Health and National Institute of Aging from US, <clears throat> the Global Brain Health Institute, the Alzheimer Associations, uh, the Tau Consortium, um, and many others local uh, sources of funding. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.